talking with Ray Bradbury, of course, uh, at his home. Ray, listen, the reason we're here, of course, yeah. is because we couldn't think of a better person to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Apollo 11 with. And I wonder if you feel as fortunate as I do in the whole history of humanity to have been alive not just when we first left our planet, but to actually set foot on other worlds. Well, when I was a young boy, I thought I'll be an old man when we land on the moon. But I wasn't old. I was 49 years old. I was very young. And I was in London that night, and I went over to be on the, the, the snow uh, TV show, and instead of introducing me, he introduced Engelbert Humperdinck. <laughs> I and remember this. I walked off the show, and the producer came running out after me. He said, what are you doing? I said, that idiot doesn't know. This is the most important night in the history of mankind. I will not be on the show with that idiot. He's stupid. Get me out of here. Get me a cab. So I went across London, and I met with Walter Cronkite. I did a broadcast on Telstar at midnight telling all the reasons why space travel was important and why it was important that we were on the moon because we were on our way to Mars. And someday we would settle Mars and then we'd go to Alpha Centauri and we'd live forever. So this is the first step to living forever. Mankind has got to beat the sun going out or the sun flaring up. So we're going to survive because of this very first step tonight, and that idiot snow should have had enough break. So you do see a role for the moon. You're you're happy uh, to see that we're on the path to returning humans there. We should never have left. We've circled the Earth with our rockets and photographed it, and that's good information. But it doesn't help us get to Mars. The moon has got to be a solid underground for us to build factories to go to Mars. And it's going to take 30 or 40 years to establish a base on the moon. And then we'll go to Mars and we'll establish a civilization there which will last for thousands of years. And then we'll move from Mars to Alpha Centauri or a planet near there. You don't sound like you've lost any confidence in the human potential in the universe. Well, we've done this. We didn't think we could do it, and we did it. It was quite amazing. And I went down. I met with all the astronauts in 1967. I went to Houston, and Life magazine sent me down to interview all the astronauts that were coming up. None of them had any names yet. <laughs> but Life magazine had a meeting in a room with 70 astronauts. And the the editor of Life magazine said, young men, I, I think you might like to know, in the back of the room today is Ray Bradbury. Everybody jumped to their feet. And 70 astronauts ran back and clustered around me because they'd all read the Martian Chronicles. Isn't that wonderful? I'm part of the, the lunar exploration, it's so wonderful to be loved by these young men who treated me as an equal. I think you're part of much more than the lunar exploration. I think of the scientists and engineers who were also inspired to do what they've done, who are still inspired, who are still leading uh, the missions that are, that are taking us off of this uh, pale blue dot. Well, it's wonderful. The night the Viking lander landed on Mars, I was out of JPL, and I was watching the photographs come in on the TV, and then noticed a, a man behind me, and I turned. It was Werner von Braun, hmm. and I didn't want to speak to him. I had mixed feelings, but I realized he was a mixed creature. He was half black, half white. He was half good. Hmm. He was half evil. He invented the V-2 rocket that destroyed England, and then he invented the rocket that took us to the moon. So I shook his hand, and he wrote an autograph on a piece of paper for me. 
You saw it all ahead of us. You inspired us. And so Werner Van Braun gave me credit for inspiring him hmm. to be a rocket engineer. Isn't that beautiful? I, I remember something else from that day. Uh, as we stood in this circle, someone came running up. This is before the Viking landed. And said, Heinlein is here, Robert Heinlein. Uh, oh, my God, and yeah. I don't know if it was you or Ted Sturgeon said, Oh, my goodness, Heinlein is here. I don't know if he's talking to me. <laughs> but he was upstairs in the cafeteria or something. Well, Heinlein was a good friend of mine, and he sold my first story for me. Isn't that unbelievable? Really? I was 19 years old, and I showed Heinlein a story, and he sent to Script Magazine for me, and they wrote me and said, we're going to publish this. And it was all because Heinlein gave it to them. I was 19 years old. Wow. He gave me a beginning. I did not know. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a wonderful story. Did, did you remain friends? Uh, no, he, he didn't like me because when the war started, he thought I should have gone out and and signed up to be a soldier. Uh-huh. And he didn't know that my vision was so bad. I was technically blind. When I went down for the examination, the I got to the optometrist, and he said, read those letters. I said, what letters? <laughs> he said, on the card. I said, what card? On the wall. What wall? And he said, give me your glasses. Let me see. So he looked at my glasses, and he said, do you really want to be in the Army? I said, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm. And I wasn't. I became 4F. And so Heinlein didn't like that, though. He thought I shouldn't be a 4F. Well, how could I change my eyes? I couldn't. I think he was sorry that he couldn't go himself. <laughs> That's right. He did a lot of subsidiary work along the way. Yeah, yeah. If you had a message for these future explorers... Uh, does anything come to mind that you might want them to to hear from No, the past? I want everybody listening to me to think of Mars, only Mars, again and again and again, and think of going back to the moon and make sure the government hears this from you. These are bad times today. If you read the Wall Street Journal, forget it, you know. If you buy stocks, sell them, get rid of them. But listen to me and say, back to the moon. The moon is everything, and Mars is beyond, waiting for us. I want to be buried on Mars. I don't want to be the first live person to arrive there and be too late, but I want to be the first dead person that gets there. I want to arrive in a Campbell's soup can and bury (laughs) me on Mars in a thing called the Bradbury Abyss. They got a name, a place on Mars for me, and I will welcome that. I would love to see that happen. From your mouth to NASA's ears, and I'm going to see what I can do to help make that happen. I hope they're listening. Yeah, me too, me too. I know we've got NASA folks out there, so uh, uh, everybody out there who works for the agency, keep that keep that request in mind. I don't want to keep you any longer uh, unless there's anything else you'd like to add. Uh, I, I mentioned to your daughter, Alexandra, who very kindly arranged for this conversation, that if you wanted to read a poem, we'd certainly be thrilled to hear one. No, I just want to pass a message to everyone about living. Number one, God goes in my left ear and goes through my brain and comes out the other, the right ear, and leaves the gossamer behind. When I wake up in the morning, God has left a gossamer there for me to read. I get out of bed and write a story. I wish this gift to you. Do what you love and love what you do. You're looking at someone here who spent his life doing what he loved and loving what he did. And that is my message to you. And Pope Bradbury bid you all good night. Thank you, Ray, and thank you for all of those stories. (laughs) Ah. That's perfect.